The Knowledge Quarter is a partnership of over 100 academic, cultural, research, scientific and media organisations located in a one mile radius around King's Cross. Together, our partners represent a concentration of knowledge and expertise to rival any in the world. Our partners include the British Museum, University of the Arts London, uh, Google, the British Library, Welcome, RADA, King's Place, and the Francis Crick Institute, as well as local community organizations such as Summers Town Community Association. Amongst our proud partners is Theatre of Debate, and we're thrilled to be bringing you an insight into one of their recent projects called COVID and Me. For those who don't know, the Theatre of Debate produces creative work that engages young people and adults in the social and ethical issues raised by advances in science and research. They work with leading scientists, experts and artistic teams to produce science plays that entertain and provoke debate. The use of entertainment as a strategy for social change is a practice that dates back to the beginnings of organized societies, life-saving information, shared values and beliefs and socially acceptable practices have been passed down from generation to generation to the art of storytelling. Since 1995, Theatre of Debate has commissioned and produced UK-wide tours of 16 original projects exploring advances in science research. In the most recent project, they've teamed up with the National Institute of Health Research, the NIHR, and Leeds University to co-produce the COVID and Me monologues. This is a series of monologues to show how people from under, um, underserved communities have been affected by the COVID pandemic. Inspired by the lived in experiences of the participants, a group of playwrights wrote 13 original monologues. Each monologue explores a character's experience of living in the world, which has been changed by the COVID-19 pandemic, capturing their thoughts and feelings about taking part in COVID-19 treatment and vaccine trials. We're going to be um, seeing two of those monologues a bit later, um, but I'm going to very quickly just show um, a short video that tells us a little bit more about the project. Usually I'm invisible. Now I'm part of the race to beat this thing. I'd help sort them, said Madam, but of course with social distancing. Imagine. You could help another dad suffer less. Get back to his family quicker. I'm very proud of her for, for taking part in those trials. Guinea pigs can be superheroes. If I said iPad to some of my clients, they'd think I was talking about incontinence pants. See, telling Pakistanis not to socialise is like telling fish not to breathe water. A wave of dread from the top of my head to the end of my toes washes over me and I have to take a deep breath before I can say... Yes? Speaking? So that was great. In this event, we're going to hear a bit more about the project and we'll be seeing some of the monologues performed live. We're fortunate to have with us today Professor Sue Pavitt and Nigel Townsend. Um, Professor Pavitt specialises in clinical trial research at the University of Leeds. She's passionate about encouraging research inclusivity and works with and for underserved communities to tackle health inequality and literacy. As a project lead at the NIHR, NIHR uh, she's the co-executive producer of the COVID and Me project. Nigel Townsend, um, is the founder and artistic director of the Theatre of Debate and has produced 33 national and international tools of plays with workshops and online research, um, online resources, um, reaching over a million young people. It's absolutely fantastic to have both um, Sue and Nigel. Um, so over to Nigel, I believe you're going to be um, uh, taking the first part. Uh, right, okay, before I go any further, I'd like to thank the Knowledge Quarter for inviting us to share this private view with you, and obviously to thank you all for coming. Um, we hope after this preview, you'll want to go to the website, I'll put the details up shortly, um, and to watch all of the monologues, all 13, um, and share them with your colleagues, friends and families, because sadly, one thing is for sure, COVID-19 isn't over yet. And you know the need for people to come forward and participate in research is still vital. 
Um, so, as Bavita said, um, Codemy introduces 10 very different characters, some of whom you can see on the screen at present, um, who share their lived in experience of COVID 19. Each of the 13 monologues explores the character's experience of living in a world which has been turned upside down by the pandemic, capturing their thoughts and feelings about taking part in COVID-19 research and vaccine trials. And several of the monologues are in other languages, um, including Urdu, Hindi, Punjabi and Bangla. So I guess, how did we get involved? Well, um, in April 2020, we were approached by Professor Sue Pavett, who we'd worked with previously on a project called Don't Smile. Don't Smile was a love story with a dental theme, which won the National Coordinating Centre for Public Engagement 2016 Award for engaging with young people. Um, so Sue came and said, you know, she wanted to know if we could work on a Todd project for the NIHR National Institute of Health Research. And uh, I remember her telling me at the time that the project would have to be delivered very quickly, uh, i.e. within three months. And of course, those three months were when we were in the first lockdown. Um, and in addition to which, there'd be inevitably be more messaging on this project than we would normally entertain. Um, and oh yes, we had to do other language versions as well. So it was a, a wonderfully exciting, but rather quite a tall order. Um, and I think I had the same feeling as when Sir Mark Wolpert suggested we might be interested in creating a Todd project about electronic patient databases for audiences aged 14 plus. Uh, the feeling was a mixture of excitement and fear, because how can we turn these things into something which is engaging and reaching out to lots of different audiences? <clears throat> and uh, that said, we decided to embrace the challenge. Uh, so how do we how do we actually work? What's our creative process? Um, I guess all projects that to date that we've done start in the same way. So whether it's a Todd Classic model, which is a live digital performance of a, a sorry a live or a digital performance, depending on you know when and where we're actually producing the plays, um, of a special commission new play followed by a debate using electronic voting or a set of monologues like the ones you are about to see today, or a primary school play in a day, a play in a day project where they do, the, the class does exactly what I've just described, they put together a play in a day. But the creative process, the journey that leads to that, starts with what we call a generator workshop, um, which brings together playwrights, researchers, and people who represent the target audiences, communities, and are happy to share their lived experience of the area of research that the project will explore. So we come together and it's very kind of uh, practical and lots of group work. It's not your sort of standard, you know, series of lectures about a particular area of research. It's a different way of approaching it. And the emphasis is very much on getting people to share what they feel, what they think, what they know about the subject matter. So these are some of the characters who uh, you will meet if you watch all the monologues. Uh, this is kind of just a quick overview of how we put things together, rigorous information gathering workshops to explore and interpret the research. And here's the sort of generator workshop, uh, just an image from one particular workshop that we were doing um, with lots of activities there rather than just sitting listening. So it's very much about engaging uh, the audience. Uh, and this is a, a just a, a clip that very first production this actually toured throughout the uk to schools for seven years um and it was around hiv and aids so it feels like we've kind of come full circle at the moment um so after the workshop um and this is an actual image of the online zoom workshop um that we that sue and ourselves put together paul COVID and me for the writers uh, to come along to. So these are members of the communities, some of the communities we're trying to reach out to. So it's very important that their voices are heard and they're there to share their lived in experience with the playwrights. Um, and um, also we have this great uh, graphic artist, illustrator, um, who captures um, the, the sessions, if you like, in a series of images, which we will then use later on in 
the resources that we are creating for uh, young people to use. Um, and this um, is, um, I, is, is answer to the question that I was posing myself, how did um, you know, the, the virus impact on our kind of creative process? Um, and well, first of all, we decided to do monologues simply because we were doing it in lockdown. It was very early on um, in, in, in the kind of virus's interference with our everyday lives. Um, and so we decided to go down the monologue route rather than doing scenarios and also because of budget implications as well. Um, and all the kind of creative stages of the process were impacted obviously by the virus. Um, the auditions obviously were online, uh, the workshops, you've just seen a big picture of um, the actual, one of the actual workshops and the rehearsals happened over Zoom. Um, and then the first set of monologues were filmed as we were coming out of the first lockdown and the second set of monologues were filmed as we were going into the second lockdown. And we filmed them both very locally at the Bloomsbury Studios, which looks tiny, it's not, um, but it was a very, it, we, we considered to be a very safe space to work in and that was perhaps the most important thing. But obviously it was a different kind of process to what we would normally do. That's David, who's the general manager with the, um, his friend. Um, sitting there really welcoming the actors when they come along. Um, and you can sort of get a sense of it's very, you know, working on the screen in a different space to the actual studio screen, uh, sorry, where the actors were being filmed. So we were working in two spaces, which made it um, quite hard work at times. Um, and that's just, that's it. Over to Sue. Okay, thank you, Nigel. Uh, do I turn this off or for Sue? Uh, you can leave it on if you want, Nigel, whichever. Okay. Uh, so early in the pandemic, it was clear that um, medical research would be the way to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. However, to achieve medical breakthroughs and deliver effective treatments and vaccines for all types of people, we need our research to engage with all types of people. And we're not very good at achieving that. Um, COVID and me, when I approached Nigel, was very much with the aim to empower people to make informed decisions of whether to take part in research or not, wanting it to both be accessible and representative of all types of people. This helps us gain understanding of the health inequalities of COVID-19 outcomes and ensure our vaccination studies reach everyone to improve the health and well-being of everybody. COVID-19 has all too drastically brought to the forefront the health and wider inequalities that are emerging and persistent in our society. It was quickly evident that some people were more vulnerable to coronavirus and increasingly clear that COVID-19 had a disproportionate impact on many of those who already faced disadvantage and discrimination. The impact of the virus had been particularly detrimental on people living in areas of deprivation, people from the Black Asian minority ethnic groups, older people, and those who are 50 plus with underlying health problems. And specifically, as we've come into the second and third waves of the virus, we've seen that obesity and younger people have been uh, particularly affected by that. We worked in partnership with people from all of these communities, very much taking a co-production approach, as Nigel has explained, listening to their lived experience in their community's apprehensions, listened and co-produced COVID and me. The challenge for researchers has been simply about simple communication. How do we achieve it? How do we build trust and find new ways to combat misinformation that is circulating in social media? And again, we're not very good at doing that. First, we need to understand the beliefs and the concerns. We don't refer to them any longer as myths because the community told us they found that rather patronizing. These are their beliefs and their concerns. And that creates hesitancy and the research needs to address that. We know that effective vaccines are the best way to protect people from coronavirus and already are saving thousands of lives. And we want every eligible person to benefit from a free vaccine, regardless of their ethnicity, religious beliefs or income. We need more research as well to understand what's going on. Finding novel ways to support our most at risk communities to engage with vaccination and research to lessen the emerging chasm of health related inequalities is very important. 
And we, were, we knew that our communities were being turned off by the nightly reports on the BBC News and, and other formats of walking through ICUs with people in PPE saying how dreadful it all was. And the great thing about COVID and me and the wonderful things that the um, script writers have achieved for us and the actors has been making it a fresh approach. There's humour, there's cultural re relevance there. The lived experience are, are brought to life and that whilst the information is factually correct, the art of storytelling really embellishes the way to convey key messages and accurate information in a much more accessible way to people. We've learned that researchers need to build that trust and communicate better. And that's why I'm so excited to work with the talented people that Nigel's brought around the table. And hopefully today you're gonna to now see for yourself that the importance of reaching underserved communities um, where we see the greatest health inequality, we have to try fresh ways. And I think this is a really novel way of trying to do that. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Before we um, go and see two of these monologues, I wanted to just quickly ask you both a question and there will be more questions later. But I know that these 13 monologues have been roughly split into two groups. And one is around the clinical trials research uh, collection. And then one is around the sort of the actual vaccine research collections. Can you just tell us a little bit about the difference between those two and what, what, what they are? I think it really reflects where we were at the time when they were produced. So at the start of the pandemic, um, we were very much focused on trying to get people aware that research was going to be important. Um, we didn't have any treatments available um, when people were getting ill um, and they were in ICU. We needed people to, or their families to consent for them to take part in research so that we could try and find new treatments. As the pandemic went on, then the vaccine um, development work was really um, starting to really heat up. And again, we needed people to take part in that research. And what was really clear was the very people that were most disproportionately affected were not the people signing up to take part in research. So this is a, an accessible way. So we were on a journey ourselves, both for new treatments and then coming through to the vaccine research. The work also has a relevance for vaccine hesitancy in general, not just research as well. Fantastic. That's really good. Thank you so much. Well, I think we should um, let's sort of have a look at one or two of these uh, monologues and see, see what the project's all about. I'm going to just share my screen again so everybody can see uh, the details of the first monologue that we're going to... Oh, this slide didn't work. Here we go. So the first monologue is called Crossing the Line. It's written by Siddha Butcher, who's here, and we'll be talking to her a bit later on, performed by Shaheen Khan, um, and it's directed by Nigel. So I'm going to stop that. I'm going to spotlight Shaheen. Here we go, Shaheen. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to introduce all the writers and the performers later on, but for now, please, over to you. I had just finished putting my dal into small Tupperwares when there was a ping on my mobile. It was only 12.30, so it couldn't be Beryl. <laughs> Every Tuesday, one o'clock, I leave the containers outside. Beryl picks them and distributes to hospital. Sometimes I watch the news and wonder if one of the nurses has tasted my dal. Hope there was not too much chili for her. It was a text from the GP surgery asking if I had symptoms and wanted to take part in COVID trial. Must be wrong number, I thought. Well, nothing happens to me. I'm always borderline. Borderline diabetic. GP says cholesterol is high, but he's happy between the balance between good and bad, so I'm borderline there too. Borders and lines. Story of my life. I have been in wars and crossed two continents before coming here. Made packets for soldiers on the front line in India in 60s. Escaped that dictator Idi Amin in Uganda. Now there's Boris's Brexit. The line is drawn, us and them. Hindu, Muslim, African. For them, we are all BAME. As if we're not unique like each of them. I'm cancer, 1st July. Same day and year as that Lady Diana. She came to open our community centre and shook my hand. I told her we were twins. 
her nails were bitten, but she hid her nerves. They had a toilet seat put in, but she didn't need the ladies. If she was alive, she would have tried to comfort the COVID patients. She was the people's princess. That Charles got the virus too. They say it does not discriminate. <laughs> then why is there more of us on the wards and dying than them? I clicked the link. It's principal trial. You have to be in 50s and have underlying condition. I can only take asthma, but that too is borderline. Only in hay fever season. And I only need my blue pump when I don't have it in my bag. Why they picked my name? It's randomized, mum. Don't take it personally. My son works upstairs now. Risk analysis. His job is safe. They need big data, mum, to make insights. Who you are, what you click on, how you respond to new treatments. He writes algorithms and goes on that Duolingo in his break. He is digital native. At least he's some kind of native to this country. I said to him, why you want to learn French when you can't speak your own language, Punjabi? He says his language is English. They should have picked my husband for this trial. He's comorbidity. I'm the core to his morbidity. He sits in front of news all day and thinks that Corona is going to get him. We women are always shielding the men. I'm the ring of steel. Nothing happens to me. I cook for him with less salt. He adds more. I give him dry toast. He adds a mountain of butter. He has a cabinet of medicines fighting against each other. He's Libra, but the scales don't balance. Doctors say, if we overtreat high BP, kidneys can suffer. If we overtreat kidneys, pressure goes up. Plus, effects of long-term diabetes. The slightest headache, he reaches for the paracetamol. If men gave birth, they would know how to let the pain flow through you. It was eye appointment for his laser treatment. Burst vessels in his eyes. GP said, you must go to hospital, it's urgent. Within two days, he had the shivers, fever, and the coughing started. He was admitted in. Corona arrived like an unwelcome guest through the back door. Husband refused to go on the patient trials. Do you think I have, don't have enough problems? I explained to him, all these pills you take, they have gone from animal to human trials before they come to you makes no difference. My GP had asked, the, asked to discuss the trial with me. She's good Gujarati from Uganda. So I agreed to sign up. I went on that website again, ticked all the answers. And before I could submit, they asked if I'm a robot. No, I'm not a robot. Son gave me iPad so I can talk to husband in the COVID ward. And I can also watch Hindi films. Like that Bala. This young man is bald and trying to win the heroine's heart by wearing a wig. Of course it was going to fall off on, on their wedding night and she runs away screaming. I was laughing so much. I started coughing and couldn't stop. That's how it started. Mild symptoms. As I'm in the trial, I can isolate at home and my GP has given me new medicine for my coronavirus. She's watching over me. Usually I'm invisible. Now I'm part of the race to beat this thing. I have crossed over the line. You have to be in it to win it. Thank you, Shaheen, for that. Um, are we going to now see the second one and then we'll talk to everybody after. So the second one, I'm just about to um, oops, share the screen and we can see it. Here we go. The last time I saw Paolo was the night he was moved out of ICU to my hospital ward. Paolo, you look better. 
I've known him since I came to the UK 25 years ago. He's like a father to me. By God's grace, he says, wheezing through his oxygen mask, I will be alive to tell the pastor to hear you. Sure, pa. Good night, Paolo. He is one of the wisest people I know. Imagine my shock two months earlier when he came to my outdoor get-together and agreed with my wife, Fola, and our two other guests that the effects of COVID-19 are exaggerated. They believed these WhatsApp messages that were being shared across their networks. I warned Fola, don't share them. Fola says, but they are true. We Africans are immune to COVID. Fola, I could understand. She was living in northern Nigeria when the meningitis trial scandal broke. But Paolo... So I say, many of my patients are our people. Oh, so we Africans are the ones spreading the virus, Pa replied sarcastically. No one is saying that, Pa. Many of us do jobs that expose us to the virus. We live in deprived areas, pre-existing conditions like your diabetes. They all make us susceptible to it. Fola says, you're a nurse. You haven't contracted it. Fola, you know the PPE I wear protects me, I hiss. Pa says, God, who is seeing me through my diabetes, will see us through COVID-19. Amen, yelled everyone, putting an end to the debate. You don't understand, I press on. Yes, we are stupid. You are the expert, Sammy huffed. He was one of our junior pastors. I didn't say that, Pastor Sammy, I reply. Pastor Adas, our other guest, also a junior pastor, chimed in. You sound like that doctor that came to the community center to talk about the trials. He dismissed my concerns as if I were a child. Fola squeezes my hand, her way of saying, stop arguing. After our guests leave, Fola says, I told you not to bring this up. I tell her. Since the trials began, not one black person has volunteered. Maybe if I join, that will convince our people. No, she says emphatically. The trials are conducted under the strictest conditions, I assure her. And the side effects, she asks. I won't know until I take the vaccine. So it's like they are giving you food without telling you the ingredients they used, she says. If we don't take part... The vaccine will be tested only on white people. It will be tailored only to them. Eh, that's okay, she says. We are immune to COVID. The following night at the hospital, Paolo tells me he will record a message for the congregation on his phone. He wants them to see how badly COVID is affecting him. He is too tired now. He'll do it in the morning. The next night, I return to find that. Pa had passed away. I call our senior pastor, Michael. He says the church will arrange the funeral. He will contact Paolo's brother in London. I was not on duty when the brother came and took Pa's belongings, including the phone. To be honest, the phone was the last thing on my mind. At a Zoom meeting before Sunday service, I ask if I could address the congregation about the trials. Pastor Sammy says, we've been through this. Pastor Adas says, Pa's death has made me rethink my concerns. We should let Brother Jide talk. The congregation believes God is in control, Sammy replies. When you are hungry, you do not open your mouth and say, God, feed me. You find your way to the kitchen. Pastor Michael says, first... The authorities said it would be years before a vaccine is found. Now they say they have all these vaccines ready to inject us with. I feel like I'm losing them. Then I remember what Fola said to me after Pa's death. Pastor Ada was right. You should know how to talk to your own people about the virus. They are afraid. I'm afraid. So I say, forgive me if I sounded like I dismissed your concerns about the vaccine. But we can't be left behind on this one. Science has advanced. The time for testing and approving new vaccines has been cut greatly. Paolo wanted you to know that COVID-19 is real. How I wish he were here to tell you himself. There is a pause 
Then Pastor Michael says, I think we should let Brother Gide talk to the congregation. Pastor Adan nods. Pastor Sammy says, I remain skeptical, but the congregation should hear Brother Gide speak. Before I'm called upon to speak, my phone rings. Paolo's brother has emailed me Pa's video recording. As I listen to Pa struggling for breath with each word, Fola wipes the tears from my face. Pastor Michael calls on me. Instead of speaking, I raise my phone to my laptop's webcam. Brothers and sisters, I'm living proof that COVID-19 is real. Please assist Brother Jide to help our community to fight this problem. God bless you all. So that was called I Can Hear You Now, uh, written by Dipo Agboluaje, who is here today, um, performed by Tunde Waba and directed by Nigel Townsend. So I'm going to invite um, all our writers and our performer. Um, so I'm going to add there Shaheen. I'm going to introduce our uh, people in the panel, and then we can um, put some questions there. So Siddha Busha is an award-winning actor, playwright. Siddha's TV and film credits include Coronation Street, Stella, Mogul Mowgli, and Mary Poppins Returns, The Lady with the Dog. Um, her writing credits include Child of the Divide, My Name Is, which she's also adapted for Radio 4, and Ch Touchstone Tales, which was a welcome collection commission. So that is one of the playwrights who created the 13 monologues in this project. Dipo has written several original plays, adaptations and radio plays. He's been right in residence at Soho Theatre and the National Theatre. Um, he's a Royal Literary Fund Fellow at the University of East London and Assistant General Secretary of the African Theatre Association. His most recent play, Here's What She Said to Me, was produced by Utopia Theatre at the Crucible Theatre in Sheffield. And Shaheen Khan, who we saw perform earlier, is an actor and co-writer whose career spans over 40 years in film, TV, stage, radio, audiobooks, and voiceovers. Her film work includes Baji on the Beach, and she's very well known as the Punjabi mother in Bend It Like Beckham. Shaheen's theatre credits include Midnight's Children, which was produced at the Royal Shakespeare Company um, at the uh, Barbican, and Rafta Rafta at the National Theatre. She won the Asian Woman of Achievement Award for Arts and Culture in 2006, um, and she is um, one of the performers in this project. Thank you all of you for coming. You can all unmute yourselves, I think. Brilliant. Um, I want to first of all just ask our two writers, Asuda and Dipo, um, what was the process like when you were first invited to this project and you had the opportunity to hear the stories from the from the people, from the public? What was that initial phase like? How how did you how did you go about doing it? Because usually these generator workshops would happen in person, but this was all done virtually. So what was that experience like? Um, shall I go first? Yeah, Suda, please. Um, so yes, I think, I mean, the generator workshop, you know, it, it was quite daunting and there were so many people, but so inspiring and, you know, people were sharing not just medical knowledge, you know, on, on where the areas of the gaps were, but, you know, coming in and talking about their lived experience as survivors, patients, and at the same time, you know, like, like the character Varsha, I had a ping on my phone where my GP had written to me, you know, asked me, I got randomly picked up for this trial. And I sort of found myself thinking, well, I'm gonna start with what happened to me, you know, so someone like me in their mid fifties, you know, I'm borderline. And in fact, last week just, you know, had red alert on my blood tests because you're pre-diabetic, your cholesterol's high, all this, but you kind of go, well, nothing happens to me, you know? So I thought, well, what what if, and, and I know at the same time, there are, you know, a lot of, 
uh, Asian women who are partners and supporters, who are carers, who always think as well that, you know, they're the ring of steel, nothing can happen to them. So I kind of combine that um, and, you know, Shaheen will talk a little bit, you know, she actually herself uh, is the dal maker. <laughs> so I sort of put those kind of things in and, and with all the kind of knowledge that we got from the generator workshops and that gave me the kind of key to start writing Russia. Um, and with the, I wrote another monologue, which was very directly inspired by, you know, people, participants who'd shared their story. So I think this is, it's a sort of combination of triggers, really. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Deepa, how was the experience for you? And how did it compare to other previous projects of this nature? Well, um, I, I came a bit uh, late into the project, but... Um, what happened was that I was um, given the recordings of the workshops and they were really very thorough, uh, the amount of information that I, that, that, that I gleaned from it. But also um, because um, I, um, I, I care for my elderly mother uh, and so I, I sort of have first-hand information on the kind of misinformation that's being spread on uh, 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 WhatsApp and uh, other networks, both in the UK and in Nigeria. So um, that that so it, it was in in that sense it was quite e easy for me to think up of a character because, um, as I said, it was it was very much uh, sort of my experience. Uh, uh, and and also trying to talk to my cousins and friends uh, uh, about it, um, but also it was also a sense of understanding where they were coming from as well, and that it wasn't out of ignorance. It, a lot of it was due to experience, as mentioned in in the monologue about some of the trials that had taken place in Nigeria. Uh, there's a historical memory, which a lot of Africans have of being used as guinea pigs, uh, unwitting guinea pigs. Uh, in, in, in trials of this nature. So for me, it was being able to, being able to allow people to see, uh, to understand what these concerns were and putting them in the forefront and letting people see the kind of debates that are taking place within the communities uh, rather than, you know, having this sort of outside view of, 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 of those debates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was it was um it, it wasn't very it wasn't very uh, uh, difficult but there was also a lot of great support from Nigel and Sue as well in terms and and many other contributors to the to the workshop as well it, it, it was a it was a process as it yeah. were yeah. can I can I just ask I mean um, how, how many writers were there in total in this project and were they all from a Bain background do you think the fact that you know, Deepa and Sudha, you come from certain communities and you've witnessed or you've experienced firsthand, you've received WhatsApp messages and you've heard families and friends talk about things. Do you think that helped shape the writing of these monologues? I mean, I definitely feel for me, you know, being part of what, yeah, from within, you're writing from within, you know, because you have access to all that kind of stuff going on, you know, including the WhatsApp messages, but also I'm everything I always do, I, I do always uh, do a lot of research. So what was really, really invaluable as well is through Sue and, the, and Nigel and the generator workshops, um, you know, um, Ruby Butty, who was in Bradford, who was at the first workshop, you know, there were people very keen to connect me with people. So I, I did actually speak to people, you know, uh, one particular guy who lost his um, father, you know, so the second monologue of the character of Asif is very much based on true stories. People like Professor John Wright, I think he's in Bradford, who's, you know, his mono, his um, podcasts about being on the COVID wards. I mean, we did a lot of research as well, you know, which feeds into that. But I think the humor is yeah. really important as well, you know, so, you know, we are all still laughing, aren't we? And we're not sort of, so, so again, you know, my son works upstairs. You know, he was um, part of the whole thing as well. Inspiration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fantastic. Um, Shaheen, I mean, you're one of you are Varsha in in this monologue. Um, what was the experience like? You at what stage did you get involved 
um, in this project. And what was it like? Um, well, I know you and Sudha have worked together on many, many things in, previously, but this might have been one of the few things within the lockdown, uh, complete virtual thing. What was that experience like for you? Well, I Sudha had written this beautiful piece and, you know, she said, I'd love you to do it. And I was like, why aren't you doing it? Because you're a brilliant actress yourself, you know. Anyway, she asked me to do it and I loved it, but I was equally petrified of learning this monologue. <laughs> Um, but so they would come and we'd sit outside because you weren't allowed to uh, meet indoors. So we'd sit outside in my garden and we'd kind of rehearse it together and chat about it. And it, it was really, really great. I mean, the first line when I first read it, you know, was about this woman putting dal and I had just finished again putting dal into, you know, containers because my husband, um, is immunosuppressant so he's in the critically vulnerable stage and of course we were we couldn't we just felt so trapped and I wanted to do things like I did want to go on trials I wanted to go uh, but I couldn't do anything and I felt so helpless so that's why I started making dal because somebody on our next door app had said you know if anyone would like to make cakes for St George's Hospital and I said I can't make a cake but I can make dal and they were like yeah great so I did that for, you know, all the weeks that everyone else was doing all that kind of, it was not just for other people, it's for yourself as well, because you feel like you want to do something. So where I couldn't do anything like to be on those trials and things, I felt like I was doing my bit for COVID. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, what do you hope will, um, that, what, what do you hope these monologue videos will will lead to what do you what you know how do you think we can use these in the best way Shaheen? well you know it's always great um as an audience to not have something bashed over your head you know like a um an issue thing you know uh, this is just lovely stories and you can just appreciate them and but get the bigger message as well you know and, and i think they can also start a debate a, more of a dialogue with people. I mean, I've been in situations where, you know, in my own family, we've had big COVID rifts. And in fact, right at the beginning, I did say, this is going to be our Brexit, because as a family, we were united over Brexit. But over COVID, I was really shocked that we, we, we're not, or weren't. But they're coming yeah. around slowly. Yeah, yeah. And I can and I can relate to this as well. I in my family, big family, that very very much a rift in um, the effectiveness of this. Is COVID real or not? Is are there all these conspiracy theories? How come they found a vaccine so quickly? Do we want to be the first lot of people to do it just because my local temple and mosque is a vaccination center? Does that make it completely safe? And you must have come across so many of these stories in your in your research. What was the most profound? or the most ridiculous or the most bonkers thing that you heard in that research phase? Um, Sudha and Deepo. Deepo, why don't you start? Um, I, 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 I can't really say anything uh, ridiculous as such. Uh, again, I think it's, again, it was because it, it, these were concerns a lot of people had and there's a lot of skepticism. I think it's, it's at a point where we're sort of in this era of fake news where anything is believable but a lot of it these things have been politicized so it's really difficult to find any sense of objectivity um and so uh, 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 for us it was uh, for me it was a way of just trying to find a way of taking the information that i that that you know that that's out there and trying to engage you know with an, an audience uh, 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 with it um that that for me was the, the the main job communication you know get a message through to people who are worried very very worried about uh, uh this thing it, it's come almost like a sledgehammer on them you know they, they, because it, it's not just the debates around the medical uh aspect of it it's also about you know uh freedom rights of people to move you know the shutting down of the economy so people's lives are also people's livelihoods are at stake as well and I think in that case, many people, people who normally I would mock or make fun of are actually, we're all in the same boat. We're all vulnerable. 
we are all vulnerable about, you know, what's going to happen tomorrow, you know, what's going to happen to our children, to our, our aunts, our, and for those of us who come from, uh, 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 who have other places that we, we also call home, what's happening to our cousins, our kith and our kin, you know, in, in, in Nigeria, in India, in Ghana, you know. So for me, it really was just about, you know, get, get the message out, try, the, the character is somebody who, probably would have been someone like me, like thinking, oh, I, I've got all this information, facts and figures, and that's going to work. Once you hear the facts, they are self-evident and they're, you know, and, and that's it, end of, end of the story, end of debate. Uh, yeah. But then he himself is challenged by uh, his own community. And it's not just about the facts, but also the, the way in which he speaks to them, the arrogance, you know, with which he speaks to them, that then he has to understand what his role is in, in the community. And that's what I put myself, that's the position I put myself in when I wrote the, the, the monologue. Yeah, 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 that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Thank fantastic. you, thank you so much. I want to bring Nigel back in again. Um, Nigel, I'm gonna just put like you. Um, I think a, a very big question, I know that a few, there are a few other writers actually from the project who are in, in the Zoom call and I'd love to bring them all in, but we are running out of time. And, and so we, we thank those writers for joining us and thank you for the wonderful um, work you've done on this project. Nigel, I think the burning question is, we've got lots of organisations in the room here from the Knowledge Quarter and lots of individuals and lots of people. What can we do with these videos? How, what, are they available for free? Are there any other resources available with it? How can I take this and share it with people in my community or people that I know to help them, to help educate them or to help them realise that there are all these voices and it's okay to be worried etc um ooh. okay so on the uh this debate website i've i've just put it up um if you look at that um you will find interviews with the writers you will find the monologues uh as a full monologue and then cut down into say three short pieces from the monologue so it can be used in different ways um and this is a mm. version as well um and also um, we've got a timeline with really lovely images and um, an ask doctor question section so you can click on questions and then up will pop uh, there's four doctors um, and they will or science and they will answer those questions so there's a lot of information already out there which is free um, i mean i think in my head, as I was just listening to all this, one of the things that struck me, because there's a lot of, you know, about going out into communities, which is fantastic. Um, but I also wondered, like, maybe about a virtual tour. Hello, everyone. Uh, and what I mean by that is something similar to this, which you book through Eventbrite, and it targets various, uh, you know, areas. Um, and you have a mix of live, and then you also have this, the, you know, the, just to be able to talk and listen to each other's ideas and things. So something quite different in technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, Sue, yeah. do you want to add anything to that? Sue? Yeah, I think I think what Nigel's just suggested is an excellent idea. I mean, we've been working with the National Institute of Health Research and they've been they're very focused on the research angle of it. Um, Nigel and I always say that these um, dramas really have power for vaccine hesitancy. And I think we're going to see some more of that with what's been going on um, this week with the AstraZeneca um, vaccine. Um, and it's important to reach out to people and, and help them understand that the research is very thorough and um, the processes that are going on are there and, and stop checks are there for, for a purpose. Um, but it doesn't stop people being fearful and the great thing that that all the script writers have done is they've they've dealt with the fear bang on and they've been trying to make them culturally relevant and humorous and 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 as Shaheen and Sudha said as well it's about making them accessible to people without sort of stamping down you've got to do it this way this is about informing people to make their own decisions about what's going on but please what we want to do is help empower them to make those own decisions really and i think yeah. that's what we're trying to do and if any organization um wants to host an event or to show the videos or they want to invite anyone to come and speak are you all available are you all is it part of the project for you to 
um, make us up available like like you have for today. Um, is that something that we can offer? I think there's a lot of goodwill among everybody to make themselves available as they are, you know, if they are available, because obviously we're all trying to work, but we're very passionate about this project. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's been a huge amount, like as Nigel said before, you know, Varsha, the second lot of monologues, some of them were sequels. So actually there's a Varsha sequel, you know, and then there's an Asif sequel. And, you know, those ones, they were translated into Punjabi, Hindi, Urdu, Bangla, you know, I, I did get my chance to play Varsha, the Punjabi version, you know. Uh, so there is a lot of stuff and that's just, you know, two of the characters, all the other yeah. characters have got sequels. And so, so really there's a rich, you know, rich material there. Fantastic. And quickly, just last question. What's the reaction been to those monologues in the other languages? Um, presumably you've shared them with friends and families or whatever. What's the reaction been so far? I mean, the reaction is very positive, you know, for the I mean, we have to say that, you know, they haven't had the the viewing that we would have hoped for. So, you know, we really want to disseminate them further. But, you know, the people have seen them overwhelmingly positive and, you know, also good to see the articulacy of, you know, our people in languages that is them rather than broken English, you know. Um, yeah. Well, yes, I think, it, but it definitely there needs to be further dissemination of them. Well, we, we hope that um, many of the Knowledge Quarter partners can can do that. We'll certainly think of ways in which we can share this um, information further afield. We've come to the end. It's, it's three o'clock. We should have ended five minutes ago. But thank you all for your time. It's very generous of you. Um, thank you all for attending. Before you leave, please do um, put some feedback in the chat. Let us know how you found this event. Um, and uh, make a note of the website, the web links that Nigel and others have posted in the chat, um, and do have a look at these monologues. I've seen them all. I can tell you they're absolutely fantastic, and I'm thrilled that we had a live reading and, a, and, and we had two of our wonderful writers from the group um, uh, tell us about the process. Thank you, Nigel and Sue. Thank you, Deepo, Shaheen, Sudha. Thank you all so much. Um, everyone, please take care. We'll see you at a future Knowledge Quarter event very, very soon. Thank you so much.